What do these three letters sound like in Greek? Do they sound the same in modern Greek as they did in ancient Greek? And how do they sound when they were adopted into Latin? In English, known as chi, theta, or theta, and phi, or phi sometimes in geology for some reason, the history of the change for these three letters is one of the most fascinating and enigmatic in the whole history of the Greek language. This question has taken me years to unravel. So even if you've followed me for a long time, you're gonna hopefully hear something new and I think fascinating in this video essay. And the answer to this question affects all of us, whether we're dealing with ancient Greek or with Latin. So let's sound the depths of antiquity together to find the answer. I'm Luke and this is Polymathy. Believe it or not, this is a highly controversial topic, and you would not believe the heated debates that erupt concerning the correct way to pronounce ancient Greek. This video continues a series on the evolution of the sounds in Greek, and on my opinions and advice for how to pronounce the ancient Greek language in practical settings, such as the classroom or in spoken conversation. And yes, there are thousands of people today who speak ancient Greek. In case you're interested, I have put into practice my recommendations for ancient Greek pronunciation in hundreds of hours of Greek audio on my audiobook store and available to my Patreon supporters. Now, some of my sources for this video essay include popular books like Greek, A History of the Language and Its Speakers by Horrocks, Vox Graica and Vox Latina by Allen, and The Pronunciation of Greek and Latin by Sturtevant. And in the description, you can find links to these books on Amazon in case you're interested. But other very academic sources that I recommend for the truly passionate include Threet's The Grammar of Attic Inscriptions and Gignac's A Grammar of the Greek Papyri of the Roman and Byzantine Periods, which deal with the inscriptional evidence in great detail. In addition to these, I'll be citing a number of ancient author primary sources, many of which are commented on in the above books. Now, what do the letters phi, theta, and chi sound like in modern Greek? Well, the letter phi, its name is phi in modern Greek, it sounds just like an English F. For example, the word for friend, philos. Theta, called theta in modern Greek, sounds just like the voiceless th sound in the English word thesis. For example, thesavros. The letter chi is called chi, and it has two sounds. Before back vowels, it sounds like the ch in the German word bach. For example, the modern Greek word chari, meaning grace. Ch or ch. Before front vowels, it sounds like ch, ch. For example, chere. This difference is caused by the palatalization of velars before front vowels, a general phenomenon in modern Greek that has its roots in certain varieties of ancient Greek during the Koine period, which we'll see more about later. Ancient Greek as a linguistic period is tied to the literature of ancient Greek. That goes from Homer in the 8th century BC until the death of Justinian in the 6th century AD. That's what is meant by ancient Greek as a term. Now that's over a thousand years, so it's not surprising that there would be diachronic changes, that is, changes through time, as well as fascinating variations in dialect, geography, and register. The ancient Greek that one can study in the classroom is a standardized form of the language with its origins in classical Attic Greek of the 5th century BC in Athens, which is followed by Hellenistic, Common Greek, or Koine, which is called Gini in modern Greek. Since Koine is based on classical Attic, and they are two dialectical variants of the same ancient Greek language with very few differences between them, one can study either classical or koine and be able to read the other without too much difficulty. As well as other forms of Greek literature like Homer's epics and Sappho's poetry. And at the Ancient Language Institute, this video sponsor, you will learn both classical and koine Greek through a rigorous and entertaining course that will take you from zero knowledge of the language to reading fluency. Through an innovative immersion approach, your teacher will be speaking to you in Greek and you will be responding in ancient Greek within the first few lessons of the course. And that's why ALI exists, to change the way ancient languages are taught, to make them more like living languages instead of focused on grammar translation. Being able to think of the language makes you a better reader. Beginner level cohorts for Latin and Greek start this summer and registration for the summer term closes May 13th. ALI also has a number of intermediate and advanced classes in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and now Old English. That's right, the language of the Anglo-Saxons, the predecessor to Middle and Modern English, is now taught at the Ancient Language Institute. 
See my interview with the ALI Old English professor here. And in August of this year, ALI is hosting a full immersion ancient Greek Bible camp in Eugene, Oregon. For more information, go to ancientlanguage.com. So how did chi, theta, and phi sound in classical Attic Greek of the 5th century BC? That, thankfully, is perfectly clear to us thanks to Attic orthography. Many Greek words start with an H sound, just like in English and German, huh? Marked by the rough breathing mark, looks like this. The prepositions apo, from, epi, on, and hypo, under or by, are frequently contracted in front of vowels. For example, apo, emu, is normally apemu. And this also occurs in front of vowels that start with the rough breathing, that H sound, such as from which. Apohu, when contracted, is rendered not like this, but like this. Apu. The rough breathing mark was introduced later to the orthography, so the letter phi here is showing us the precise pronunciation of the letter when the contraction was first formed. A P sound plus an H sound. Ba plus ha. Pa. This is what the sound looks like in the International Phonetic Alphabet. Pa. This also happens in the phrase every day. Kata hemeran. Kata hemeran in classical Attic pronunciation, as well as the word not, u, which is uk in front of vowels. And in front of the rough breathing, it's spelled like this, ukutos. And we have a plethora, would you say I have a plethora? of supporting pieces of evidence for the conclusive proof that k, t, p are the correct pronunciations of the letters in classical Greek. And I refer you to Walks Graika by Allen for more. Thus, in classical Attic Greek of the 5th century BC, we can be certain that letter phi is pa, letter theta is ta, and letter chi is ka. These sounds are called aspirates, and see my international phonetic alphabet videos for more on these linguistic terms. That means that classical Greek has nine stops in the categories of velar, dental, and labial. Three are voiced stops, g, d, b. Three are voiceless, unaspirated stops, g, t, p, and three are voiceless, aspirated stops, k, t, p. And these three are called simply aspirates for short. Indeed, the ancient Greek grammarians also classify them in the same group of stops. So the fricative nature of ch, th, f, as in modern Greek, that must have happened later than classical times. The aspirate nature of k, t, p is also true initially in Koine, the common Greek that comes into contact with Latin, where pilipos is rendered as pilipus, teseus as teseus, and karon as karon. Differently from their pronunciation in English or German, these three digraphs in classical Latin are meant to be pronounced literally, letter by letter. P, h, p, t, h, t. Kuh, kuh. It's at this point that I should advise you that unless you've done phonetic linguistic training, you might not hear the difference between ba, pa, ta, ta, ka, ka. That's because this phonemic contrast doesn't occur in a lot of European languages. The very people studying ancient Greek rarely speak or know a language that can make this fundamental distinction. Hindi and Chinese are two languages that do. Hindi has the advantage of also having voice stops, so it's probably the best model if you're looking for people who have phonemic aspirates natively. In English, we do have aspirated pataka, but only word initially and before a stressed syllable. Hence pan and appalled, but ripping, not ripping, making, not making. Because we associate aspirates so strongly with initial voiceless stops, making sounds like making but with a strange intonation. This is also roughly the situation in German. Thus Germans and Anglophones have to pay very, very special attention when dealing with aspirates. So unless you've had very intensive training on how to distinguish aspirated stops from unaspirated ones, you should be very careful about employing them. More on that later. So if chi, theta, and phi are all aspirates in classical and Koine Greek, as well as Latin, when do they start to become fricatives, like in modern Greek? It's time to journey to Egypt. 
that's because we have to find out when the voice stops we saw earlier, gamma, delta, and beta, became fricatives, as they are in modern Greek. In modern Greek, these letters are pronounced r, v, v. So all six of these letters are fricatives in modern Greek. Now, velars in modern Greek, like I mentioned earlier, are palatalized before front vowels. Thus, the word for high is pronounced ya, since ya is the palatalized version of r. But this consonant sound, ya, is different from the semi-vowel ya. I know, they sound real similar. In German, the word for yes is ya. That's a semi-vowel. But in Greek, the word for high is ya. So it's the difference between ya and ya. The difference is that the fricative has less space between the articulating elements. But if they sound similar to you, that's okay, because as we'll see, they also did to people in antiquity. And the really crazy thing is that in Egypt, there is evidence that the modern Greek pronunciations of these letters were already starting back then, 2,000 years ago, during the Roman classical period. The evidence for a fricative as well as palatalized pronunciation of gamma, just as modern Greek, is most striking in spellings like this for the name of Trajan, Trajanos, in the first century, as well as gamma being inserted into the word for sun, huyos, and into the word for temple or holy, hieron. It is incredibly strong evidence that this letter sounded a lot like the modern Greek version, at least in Egypt. Now amazingly, Coptic orthography, which comes from the same period, borrows the aspirates of chi, theta, and phi, ka, ta, pa, for aspirates in the Egyptian language, also pronounced ka, ta, pa. And vice versa, demotic and pre-Coptic were written sometimes in pure Greek letters, and they show the same usage of chi and theta and phi for the aspirates in Egyptian. Thus, in Bohiric Coptic, ka, ta, pa represent the same aspirates of ka, ta, pa in the contemporary Koine Greek in Roman Egypt. Now, the Coptic language natively has ch and fa, but instead of using the Greek letters chi and phi for these, as one would expect, if they had a fricative sound in Greek at the time, new Coptic letters were invented, derived from earlier traditional demotic, ultimately from hieroglyphics, ch and fa. Coptic also has a sound equivalent to the aspirate, the H sound, h, or possibly h used in native terms and words borrowed from contemporary Greek, like hirene, peace, right from the Greek hirene, which is the contracted form of he irene, the peace, demonstrating important things about Roman-era Egyptian koine. It retained the h sound, the ha. The epsilon iota, of course, is just a long e sound and had been for many centuries, as I demonstrated in this video. And the letter eta had not yet merged with the e. That merger would happen later in Byzantine Greek. And most germane to our discussion in this video, Coptic definitively shows us that the aspirates are retained through at least the 4th century AD. At least in Egypt. What about elsewhere? Well, in the Armenian and Georgian alphabets, we have a similar situation as in Coptic where the classical aspirate letters are still the sound of aspirated stops. And this continues in those languages all the way until the 10th century AD. So, that's case closed, right? There you go. <laughs> I used to think so. In these old videos, I heavily advocated for the aspirate pronunciation of chi and theta and phi, so ka, ta, pa, as the only truly correct pronunciation through all of antiquity. We'll come back to this. Because the case isn't closed at all. Pompeii, where so much ancient history is preserved to us, we have a number of fascinating inscriptions. One of them is this, Daphne, for what we would think would have to be Daphne. Now, inscriptions prior to the first century AD show Latin speakers often rendering the aspirates as their unaspirated equivalents in Latin. So just Philippus, Theseus, Caron and any other number of words borrowed from Greek, they don't have the H next to them, since Latin has no such native phonemic distinction. And Romans likely couldn't hear the difference without sufficient training, just like English speakers. A spelling like Daphne instead of Daphne or Daphne proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the person who wrote it had a fricative pronunciation for letter phi, or had learned a fricative pronunciation from native Greek speakers. Numerous other examples include Phileto, and even the Latin name Rufus 
spelled with a PH. One of my favorite demonstrations of the normalness of a fricative pronunciation of phi in Pompeii is the inscription at the restaurant called Galbona of Euxinus and Justus, also called the Thermopolium of the Phoenix, where it is written Poenix Felix et tu. A standard classical Latin pronunciation doesn't reveal much, but if we remember that even in urban Latin of the first century, the diphthong oi, well, that was merged to e for most speakers. Hence, the Italian word bena with the closed e vowel, because it came from bena, derived from boina, the earlier, more standardized classical spelling, while cello with an open vowel is from gailu, and this shows us how i and au persisted as diphthongs, the urban form of Latin, until a much later period. I talked about that in the Latin to Italian video, so go see that. So, oi is already a. Now let's apply the necessary pronunciation of Latin ph and Greek phi for this region, and we get a catchy little slogan instead. Phoenix felix et tu. Wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? Wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? Phoenix felix et tu. Phoenix and felix have perfect alliteration. Every consonant is the same, every vowel and vowel length is the same, except for the central consonant. Phoenix, Phoenix. Absolutely beautiful. And that's not all. Pompeii also has this. Las fe, for, in an archaic pronunciation, las te, or what it has to be, which is las te. Now, this is incredibly startling, since the writer sought to represent the certainly fricative nature of the theta in the word, but as th and th are acoustically similar, he wrote an f. And interchange like that happens in a number of British speakers of English, where f is used for th, such as the word thought, which in certain British accents, instead of sounding like thought, sounds like foot. Hence the YouTuber thoughty2 is actually forty2, since thoughty and forty have merged completely in that dialect. Hey, 42 here. And this also occurs in Cyrillic, where numerous terms with theta in Byzantine Greek, where the pronunciation was th, they're rendered instead by the Cyrillic letter for a pho sound, taken directly from the Byzantine Greek letter phi, also, of course, an f sound, pho. Hence, in Ukrainian and Russian, the city of Marathon is marathon. Thus, the only reasonable explanation for Lasfe in Pompeii is that certain Greek speakers already had the fricative theta and phi in the early to mid first century AD, and that the likely native Latin speaker who wrote Lasfe, well, he heard Lasfe, but he only had pho. He didn't have th in his native language. So when he heard th, he perceived it as the same as his f sound. Absolutely incredible and quite conclusive. As for the letter chi, determining exactly when this becomes other than an aspirate is much harder, because interchanges of the type lasfe, well, they're not going to show up as obvious spelling errors. But tantalizing potential evidence does exist in Catullus 84, where the poet mocks a certain arius for adding Greek aspiration, that is the h sound, h, huh, to Latin words where they don't belong, like commoda for commoda or hincidias for insidias, which Arius does, evidently, as a way of making himself sound erudite, like those trained in rhetoric in Greece, perhaps comparable to hypercorrections in English used by the educated, like processes or processes, which is incorrect, instead of the correct English processes or processes, or others who say for you and I, instead of the correct for me and you, or for you and me. The last couplet is of particular interest in Catullus 84. After Arius is sent across the sea, the horrible message is brought. Ionios fluctus posqui lucarius iset, iam non Ionios esse, sed Ionios. The traditional explanation is that it's a joke or a play on words. That Arius is puffing so much air by saying ha 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 on everything that he's causing wintry storms, or for the whole Ionian Sea to freeze over. This would be the Greek adjective kionios, from kion, which is snow. Now, in 
Attic and Koine, the iota is normally short, but in epic poetry it's normally long, which makes it perfectly appropriate, given that this is a poem, if Catullus was indeed intending to reference this word for snow, or snowy. If Catullus did indeed want us to think Kionios based on Hionios, then the conclusion is that Greek spoken by at least some of the people in Catullus' day actually pronounced the letter chi as a fricative, Hionios instead of Kionios. While I don't know of any evidence of the merger of ch with h, that is a fricative velar ch with the h sound h, that doesn't mean it couldn't have happened in native speakers of Latin. For example, native speakers of English, we have the h sound. But many native speakers of English, especially in front of the e vowel sound, they won't say he, but they'll say she. Try it now if you're a native English speaker. Do you say he or she? That is to say, a lot of native English speakers automatically bucolize the aspirate, the H sound, the H, and make it a palatal fricative, he. Now as for this interpretation of the last word in Catullus 84, other scholars have cast doubt on it as the best explanation. But it's not the only evidence for a fricative chi during Hellenistic times, since elsewhere, as Schweitzer demonstrates, there's good evidence for a fricative chi in Asia Minor as early as the second century BC. And Benjamin Cantor, who runs the wonderful KoineGreek.com website and YouTube channel, wrote last year about his discovery of very good evidence for the fricative pronunciation of letter chi in antiquity in the Codex Vaticanus, where Hebrew sh is represented by the innovative digraph chi sigma, which only really makes sense if chi is a fricative instead of an aspirate. But whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Earlier, we saw that Coptic, Armenian, Georgian, they all show us, indisputably, that Koine Greek, Katapa, Chi Theta Phi, were aspirates through antiquity. Yet the same Koine Greek has them as fricatives? There's a term for this. What's that called? Oh yeah, it's called a... Contradiction. Similarly, while there is ample evidence for the fricative nature of Ra, Da, Va in Egypt, there is none in Italy. Now in Italy in the first century, we do see the letter B being used in place of V, but we don't yet see V for B until later. Now, while a full merger between both V and intervocalic B is possible as early as the first century AD, I think the more likely explanation is that the letter B is a stop in all positions for most speakers in the first century, while the V is becoming a bilabial fricative, V or something like it. The merger between the two, that is the intervocalic B, and the V in all positions, that becomes a general phenomenon after the second century AD. See my video on the letter V here. And even as later grammarians toward the end of classical Latin acknowledge the fricative nature of letters like phi, they maintain the normal voice stop nature of gamma, delta, and beta. Ga, da, ba. Another phenomenon worthy of mention is something called aspirate assimilation. So in classical Attic inscriptions, we occasionally see spelling errors of the type partenos for partenos. So what's happened is that the aspiration on the theta has been used by the speaker also on the letter pi, turning it into letter phi. So partenos instead of partenos. This is actually something that I and other people who attempt to use aspirates occasionally do. You think about the aspirate ahead of time and the ta, and so you add it by accident to one of the other letters. A similar phenomenon is called aspirate metathesis. For example, the ionic inscription kiton for kiton, which is interesting because it shows us that those classical era dialects also had aspirates and not fricatives. This phenomenon is of course fascinating on its own, but the really weird part is that Aspirate assimilation, inscriptional errors of the type partenos for partenos, duplos for duplos, and antilokos for antilokos, all of those suddenly stop after the 3rd century BC, near the beginning of the Koine period. Now, does that mean that from the 2nd century BC onward, is this the point where phi, theta, and chi become fricatives in all Greek? But we still have the definitive evidence for aspirates in Egypt and elsewhere including, again, in Rome. According to Quintilian, Cicero made fun of a Greek witness who couldn't pronounce his defendant's name. His defendant was Fundanius, so this Greek must have said Pundanius. So what's going on here? A few years ago, I was really racked by this question. 
Did Greek have fricatives in the first century AD or not? Did the voice stops or the aspirate stops become fricatives first? Now back then, I was of a similar mind as other commentators on the subject, that there must be some dominant Koine pronunciation, and anything contrary to that model must be some aberration and not worth considering. Either some forms are just hypercorrective archaic spellings, or others are low register substrate influenced pronunciations. And regardless of which of these I or other commentators have used, the thing discarded is considered not the real Greek. But as I've continued to look at this problem, rereading thousands of pages of inscriptions and phonological commentary, it has become apparent to me that a more likely explanation is simply dialect variation in the same language. And once I embraced this approach, everything started to make a lot more sense. Thus, it may be reasonable to assume that certain dialects of Koine Greek, such as in Italy, had voiceless fricative fa and th for phi and theta, and possibly even ch for chi in the first century AD. But gamma, delta, and beta were still g, the, b, the voiced stops. While in Egypt, the reverse was true. Aspirated stops for k, th, p, but voiced fricatives for r, v, v. And in some areas, all six were likely fricatives. And in others, they were all retained as stops. So far, I've kept the discussion on core ancient Greek, which is classical Attic and the Koine based upon it. But classical Attic had contemporary dialects like Aeolic, Ionian, and Doric. And Doric was the dialect within which was Laconic or Laconian, the dialect of the region around Sparta. In Aristophanes, the fifth century Athenian comic playwright, Spartans are depicted saying naitosio o parsene with a sigma standing where theta would be expected. But the sigma here doesn't mean the sound an actual laconic was a s, but more likely th. Since Laconian inscriptions actually maintained theta and they didn't use sigma for quite some time, it seems absolutely clear that the 5th century BC laconic pronunciation had th, so theos, and that the closest sound in Attic was s which is why Aristophanes wrote it that way. Nevertheless, this dental fricative, th, continued to evolve, and modern Siconian, which is spoken in the same region as the Spartans once occupied, has a sigma from an inherited sound that was th much earlier. But as Horrocks tells us, these other non-classical dialects from the Greek classical period did not survive independent of the dominance of Koine, with the exception of certain aspects of Tsikonian remarkably preserved. Where fricatives may have emerged in earlier dialects, it's possible they influenced the development of fricatives in Koine, or perhaps fricatives developed independently in Koine. Now, whatever their origin, it seems clear that the six letters Gamma Chi, Delta Theta, Beta Phi, each began their path to fricativization in different places at different times, and that eventually the fricative pronunciations of all six predominated by Byzantine times. So what should we do as students or teachers of ancient Greek? One option, of course, is to use different pronunciations for different dialects in different centuries. This has a number of complications, however, beyond the obvious difficulty of needing to remember the different sounds of different dialects and to recall those and use them spontaneously. As I've told those who seek to recite the Iliad and the Odyssey and Homer's pronunciation, well, it's not really possible to do that with the text that we have, since the orthography has been standardized to Attic, and thus to get at Homer, you'd have to restore the mostly unattested but perhaps reconstructable spelling for each word. And the other problem is that Homer's work includes passages inherited from different dialects from different centuries that go way before him. Would Homer himself have respected those phonologies or used his own? Now, I'm not saying it's outright impossible to reconstruct how Homer may have sung his epics, but I'll tell you, that's the kind of thing that makes even a phonology-obsessed nerd like me say, no way, man, I don't want to waste my time, which should tell you how hard or perhaps ultimately less fruitful such an undertaking might be, in my opinion, of course. And fruitful for what? If we learn to pronounce Sappho's works as close as we can to her reconstructed voice, well, that's amazing. But just like with Homer, the vast, vast majority of those who appreciated them recited them in the dominance Attic or Koine phonology of their day. 
while using different pronunciations for different authors is very cool, and I've experimented with this both in Latin and Greek, it's simply not practical for most people. Most people just want to read and engage with the literature and use some kind of plausible pronunciation that was found in antiquity. Thus, it's reasonable to choose one pronunciation as our core voice when dealing with the literature. Although I can speak Latin fluently, either in classical or ecclesiastical pronunciation, this kind of code switching in phonology, it just isn't for everyone. And it's pedagogically perfectly acceptable to use just one or the other for dealing with any period of Latin literature. And I think a similar approach needs to be acceptable for dealing with ancient Greek. So what do we choose? Given the prestige of Attic, starting from the fifth century, but continuing through all of antiquity to the present day, should we not recite ancient Greek and the restored classical sound of Athens? That's the basis of everything, right? Well, one problem is that classical Attic has a number of characteristics that make it very hard for most people to pronounce in a way that doesn't lead to a lot of confusion. Attic, for example, differentiates between short diphthongs and long diphthongs. Two short diphthongs include I and oi, and their long counterparts are I and oi. But most people today who attempt the long diphthongs, they just merge them completely with the short ones, and they're not aware that they're doing so. And in any case, since the long diphthongs had already merged with the long ones, ah and o, oh, by classical Roman times, this is what most people do today, and I think this is pedagogically sound. But phi, theta, and chi were clearly aspirates at the beginning of the Roman period, certainly for most speakers. So should we not use aspirates in our ancient Greek recitations? Now, I used to favor this option, and these old videos of mine, there I strongly advocated for the aspirates. But then I heard how most people employ the aspirates, or try to employ the aspirates. And this is not their fault, but like I said earlier, hearing the difference between ba pa ta ta ka ka it seems so minute to us. Unless we speak a language natively like Hindi or Chinese, or have a lot of experience with those languages, or we have sufficient training in linguistics. And if we don't have that training, the result are some very strange exaggerations. Namely, most people who try aspirates, since they can't hear the difference between actual aspirates and unaspirated stops clearly, they end up making their aspirates affricates. Instead of pa, they'll say pa. Instead of ta, they'll say ta. Instead of ka, they'll say ka. And those are different. I know this may sound like really subtle splitting hairs to you, especially if you're an English speaker and you haven't done linguistic training specifically in aspirates or affricates. But trust me, these are completely different phonemes and it's a big deal. It's a huge different choice to say pa, ta, ka instead of pa, ta, ka. The affricates are not the sounds that phi and theta and chi make in classical Attic. Affricates are composed of a stop, in this case, ba, ta, ka, followed by a fricative, in this case, fa, tha, ka. Germans and Anglophones in particular often make this situation even worse because, like we discussed before, our initial voiceless stops are always aspirated. So without intensive linguistic training, we think we're aspirating an initial voiceless velar to make chi. So we want to make ka, but we actually end up saying ka. For example, the correct Attic pronunciation for this word, which means land or territory or country, it's kora, kora. Instead, they'll think, oh, no, I need to aspirate, and they'll say kora. That's an affricate. While word internally, they might actually get the aspirate correct and say akaris. Sounds super subtle though, right? This is why I don't really recommend this to most people. Or they, like most people, might not think that the aspirate is strong enough, and they'll try to reinforce it with the affricate saying akaris. In any case, the result is utterly bizarre inconsistencies. Now, people can speak any way they want, and if they're enjoying everything they're doing, that's fine. But if the purpose of doing this is to actually attain a more authentic sound, this is not the way to do it. <laughs> it that's why it leads to so many problems. And I don't blame these people. It takes a long time to master these kinds of sounds, and it's just not what most people are interested in. And I really accept that now. I myself to this day, when attempting an aspirate, sometimes an affricate comes out by mistake, for the same reason. And I repudiate my former videos, where I insisted an aspirate pronunciation was the only right way.
So for this and other reasons, true classical Attic pronunciation in general, and the aspirates in particular, they're just out of reach for most people. Again, I think that's fine, though I do welcome very in-depth linguistics training for classicists around the world, but this just isn't a practical solution for most teachers and students of Greek. And like I just noted, the vast majority of people who try to make aspirates, pataka, actually make affricates, pataka. Now, in reality, in the evolution of these Greek sounds, from the aspirate to the fricative, the transitional stage was almost definitely these very affricates. So, chi went from k to k to h. Theta went from th to th to th. And phi went from p to f to f. Now that's a bilabial fricative. F, f. It's like whistling badly. The same bilabial fricative is found in modern Japanese. F. And this bilabial fricative may have readily changed to the labiodental, the f sound, as we have in modern English. The Phoenix Felix et tu that we saw before suggests that the transition from bilabial f to labiodental f may have already occurred at Pompeii. It's a reasonable assumption, by the way, that the Latin f was also a bilabial fricative all the way up to the first century BC. In the first century AD, we have Quintilian attesting that the F sound is the lower lip making contact with the upper teeth. So at least from the first century AD, the same time as the Phoenix Felix et tu, we know that it's like English F. At least for some, if not all, Latin speakers, the Greek still could just be bilabial. When Raphael Torrijano and I developed the Lucian pronunciation, meant to be a transitional pronunciation that could have been heard in the classical Roman period, Raphael strongly advocated for the affricates as the standard variant of Lucian pronunciation that we wanted to propose, since they are indeed the true transitional sounds of these letters. And while his point was stronger from a linguistic point of view, I still managed to persuade him why I didn't think it was the best recommendation for people. Like aspirates, they don't occur as distinct phonemes for a lot of native languages of the people trying to learn ancient Greek, so it becomes another burden on the student. They're just about as difficult to get right as aspirates. And that's because most people that are using affricates now, thinking that they're doing aspirates, well, they end up doing something like this. So here's the word, the philosopher, hopilosopos. Those are the aspirates, hopilosopos. So because that sounds too subtle for them, again, I totally understand why they would do this, they'll make them into affricates, trying to make them sound like the real what they think isn't the aspirated sound of the letter. Hopilosopos. Now what's so wrong with that? The problem is that these are geminated affricates that they're doing. And something like this, hopilosopos, is best analyzed as two consonant sounds in sequence. Now that is a huge problem, because now, instead of five short syllables, as in hopilosopos or hopilosopos, if it's hopilosopos, the syllables before the phi are now long since the letter phi is being turned into two consonants. And again, a person doing something like that is doing it because they think that's what the aspirate has to sound like. So if aspirates and affricates are out for all but the most dedicated of phonologists, that leaves us with fricatives for chi and theta and phi. And this is how Erasmian pronunciation is normally rendered. But since the philological consensus is that the dominant Koine pronunciation shows that gamma, delta, and beta became fricatives long before chi, theta, and phi, as Booth notes very well in his famous paper, Erasmian has the whole paradigm upside down, doesn't it? And this is one of the reasons I used to speak out so strongly against Erasmian pronunciation. It seemed downright anachronistic. But after more carefully examining the evidence, it does seem reasonable that, at least in parts of Italy, Greek speakers had fricatives for chi and theta and phi, but stops for gamma and delta and beta. And if that's true, then one of my biggest complaints about Erasmian pronunciation's anachronism was actually unfounded. Ultimately, such a system where chi, theta, phi are fricatives and gamma, delta, beta are stops is much easier than the alternatives, both in production and in comprehension. The most important aspect of Erasmian to reform, besides the letter zeta, which I talked about here, is the pronunciation of epsilon iota, which is not a diphthong, as I demonstrated in this video. Epsilon iota is either e or e, depending on the century. 
So when it comes to the practical usage of most people, I do recommend chi, theta, and phi as fricatives for the majority of those who would study ancient Greek. Now, when it comes to the fricative pronunciation of letter chi, something that a lot of Spanish speakers have to be careful of, and to a lesser extent Italians and the French, is to clearly distinguish the rough breathing, that is the huh, the H sound, from the letter chi. Because I've been confused a lot by Spanish speakers who often say chairi and hairi exactly the same. English speakers have to be careful not to merge the initial H sound followed by E with the letter chi as a fricative plus E, like hiton. People who say he instead of he in English, they might say hieron instead of hieron. So being mindful of the inevitable interference of our native languages is really important for the purposes of clear communication, no matter what system of pronunciation we might employ. As for Latin speakers, we have a few options when it comes to the PH and TH and CH. We might pronounce the Greek words borrowed into Latin, like pilosopus, teka, karta, exactly as written, with the aspiration, as I just did here. I know, it's subtle, right? Alternatively, we could ignore the aspiration completely, as likely many Latin speakers would do, since these weren't native phonemes. Unaspirated, these are pilosopus, teka, karta. Can you hear that difference? Pilosopus, pilosopus, teka, teka, karta. Carta. We also see that the PH began to be pronounced just as Latin F for some Latin speakers in the first century AD. And that's the usual practice for most Latin speakers today, who will also merge the TH with T and the CH with C. I used to be openly critical of this very practice of saying philosophus, but teca and carta for people using the restored classical pronunciation, but now I realize probably a lot of people who were doing exactly that in the first century. While this may not have been the pronunciation of the most erudite who used contemporary Greek sounds, whether aspirates or fricatives, for all three, it certainly seems likely for a lot of Latin speakers in the three centuries of the classical period. So like many aspects of Greek phonology, the letters phi, theta, and chi have a very complicated history, and it's taken years to wrap my brain around them. I hope this video has served as a summary of some of the most critical parts of the history and has given you enough information to make your own decisions when working with ancient Greek. In the future, I'm going to make a video where I show you clear variants to choose from because when Rafael Torrijano and I made that Lucian pronunciation video a few years ago, we said, okay, this is the main pronunciation variant that we're recommending, but there are other variants you can choose from that would still all be part of this whole Lucian pronunciation idea, right? So, but we didn't give you really clear, very specific variants. So those are coming soon. And I think it's going to be pretty interesting. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you to the Ancient Language Institute for supporting this video. And thank you above all to each and every one of my Patreon supporters. Walete hygienete. Wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? What is going on? I, I don't know. Oh.